Welcome back everybody to our course Introduction to Quantum Optics. Today we want to gear up for the quantization of the electromagnetic field, but first we want to look at some classical field solutions of the radiation field in a box and determine the wave equations and the energy density of such a field. So let's get started. So our starting point are Maxwell's equations in free space without any charges or currents in the system, so we just have divergence of E equals zero, divergence of B equals zero, curl of E minus dB dt, and curl of B, one over C squared dE dt. Now, uh, usually we can rewrite Maxwell's equations in terms of the potentials, the scalar potential phi and the vector potential A, but if we choose a special gauge for these kind of potentials, the so-called Coulomb gauge, then we can describe the E field and B field in this situation purely through a vector potential. So we introduce the vector potential A of r, t, and from this vector potential we'll see actually we can derive all the electric and magnetic fields in the system in the situation we're discussing here, in this so-called Coulomb gauge where the divergence of A equals zero. So we can, for example, calculate the magnetic field by simply taking the curl of A. We can calculate the electric field by taking the time derivative of A. So minus dA dt gives us the electric field. So A contains all the information about the B and E fields in our system. So what kind of equations, dynamical equations, govern the evolution of this vector potential field A of R, T? Well, let's just, for example, calculate curl of B. Uh, B is just curl of A, so this just gives us this left-hand side. But we also know from Maxwell's equations that curl of B is 1 over C squared dE dt. So, and dE dt, we actually know, is minus dA dt. So we can just put these two together uh, for the right-hand side to arrive that the curl of B, this 1 over C squared dE dt term, that's just minus 1 over C squared d squared dt squared of A. Now let's calculate this left-hand side. Let's use a little bit of vector calculus to calculate the curl of curl of A. So that would be the gradient of the divergence of A minus the Laplacian of A. And since we're working in the Coulomb gauge, this first part, the divergence of A term, vanishes and it cancels out. And we're just left with the Laplacian minus Laplacian of A equals minus 1 over C squared dt squared of A. So putting these two together, we arrive at the dynamical equation, the second order differential equation for the vector potential that governs its dynamical evolution. And of course, you should be not surprised to see that that's just a standard wave equation for this vector potential with the propagation speed given by the speed of light c. Now the solutions of this wave equation can be written, for example, simply as plane waves. So we can write them, for example, as a plane waves in the following form, where we have a polarization component. So this is the polarization vector of this radiation field with wave vector k and polarization component alpha. Then we have the complex amplitude of the field, describing the strength of the excitation and the phase. And we have the wave vector, k, describing the propagation direction of the wave, with norm of k being simply 2 pi over lambda, the wavelength of the radiation field that we're describing, and the frequency of the radiation field omega k, which in this case in free space is simply given by the propagation speed in vacuum, that's just a speed of light, times k, so ck, omega k equals ck. So these are the general solutions of this wave equation. And uh, let's now look how we can introduce boundary conditions into our problem. So typically, if we would have an infinite space, if we would have infinitely sized system, then the k-vectors would be unrestricted and could take any kind of continuous form that one would uh, imagine. However, the typical situation we want to discuss is the situation where we confine, for example, the radiation field to a box, or we just, for simplicity, introduce periodic so-called boundary conditions requiring us that, for example, the field allowed field solutions that we introduce are the same on the left and right hand side on the box, the bottom and top hand side, and the front and back side of the box. So this requires that the phase factors of this vector potential 
are the same on the left and right, front, back, bottom, top. And for example, one solution of that would be a, a plane wave of this form, where we arrive at the same phase factor, for example, in the x direction uh, for the system. So how can we write this in a formal way? Let's take a look at a vector potential propagating in the x direction. So uh, we have a box of length L, so we want that the phase factors after propagating over distance L come back to the original phase factor. So that means like kx times L should be just an integer number multiple of 2 pi, 2 pi and x. And the same of course is true for ky and kz. So we actually find that there are only discrete wave vectors allowed for the vector potential. And these discrete wave vectors, together with their polarization components, they are called the modes of the field, the allowed modes of the field that are compatible with our boundary conditions and determined by our boundary conditions. And now we can write a general solution of the vector potential A of R, T simply as a Fourier decomposition of all of those modes. So we simply take a sum over all of those modes and in order for the vector potential to be real we have to kind of sum up over the two complex conjugate Fourier components in our system. Now if we want to derive from this vector potential the electric field for example, the oscillating electric field of our light field, then we simply have to take the negative of the time derivative of the vector potential as we introduced in the beginning of this lecture in this Coulomb gauge. Uh, this is done here, so we take the time derivative. This gives us here this minus i omega k term that we have here together with the minus term gives us plus i omega k here and uh, the ak, ak star terms. We can also calculate the magnetic field b of r comma t and that's just calculated through the curl of A and through a similar calculation you find this expression for the magnetic field derived from these vector potential solutions written down in this Fourier decomposition form over the plane wave solutions of the vector potential in our box. Now let's think for a moment if we want to calculate the total energy stored in the radiation field of our system. So we have the box we have the different plane waves in there given by the vector potentials, each one given by strength AK uh, of that field excitation. And now we want to calculate how much energy do we actually have in that box, purely energy of this radiation field. Well, classically, that would just be given by summing over the energy densities of the energy stored in the electric field part and the energy, energy density stored in the magnetic field part of our electromagnetic fields, of our light fields in this box. Now the energy density of the electric field part, that's just one half epsilon zero e of r comma t squared. And the magnetic energy density stored in the magnetic field part, that's just one over two mu zero b of r comma t squared. And if we want to have the total energy of the system, well then we just have to integrate this energy density over the whole box size. And this is what we're doing here. So we're just integrating over the volume of the box, over the sum over the energy densities of the electric field and magnetic field energy density. Now if we do that and we take the expressions that we derived in the last slide, thinking, taking the expressions of the electromagnetic, of the electric field and the magnetic field, using the vector potentials, we actually arrive at the following simple form for this energy, total energy stored in the system. Okay? And um, we can now think of this as the total energy being given by a sum of energies in the individual modes, each mode being given by the k vector k and its polarization component alpha. So we have different amounts of energy stored in the different modes of the radiation field and we just sum up this energy uh, over the different modes of the radiation field. And the energy of each mode is just given by this expression here, ek comma alpha, this epsilon zero v omega k squared term and these complex coefficients that we have here. Now since these are just complex numbers you might wonder well why didn't you just turn them around, commute them and kind of write them together. I could have done that of course for these complex conjugates but actually, if you remember the last lecture on the quantum harmonic oscillator, we already uncover, encountered a very similar expression here, 
with the AK, AK dagger, AK dagger, AK operators, giving the energy of the harmonic oscillator. And this gives us a hint for the next class, what we're going to encounter when we're going to look at the quantization of the electromagnetic field. So this is what I wanted to tell you today. We looked at the vector potential uh, as solutions of the radiation field in a box. We found there are only quantized modes possible if we introduce boundary conditions into the system. And we wrote down the energy density as a sum of energies in the different modes of our system uh, and this kind of form which we're going to relate to the form of the quantum harmonic oscillator in the next class. Thanks for watching today and I'll see you next time.